Please welcome Almond Board of California Board of Directors Chair Alexi Rodriguez and Almond Board President and CEO Clarice Turner. Who says there are no bright spots in our industry right now? We've got Neon Dion, Coach Prime himself, up on the big screen, and we have Clarice Turner here for her first Almond Conference. Why don't you all join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. It is a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for taking on this challenge. We are looking forward to working with you, hopefully, for many years to come. Thank you. Of course. Now, on to our regularly scheduled program. Uh, welcome to the 51st Annual Almond Conference. As you know, this event would not be possible without the generous support of our 250 exhibitors and 29, spo 29 sponsors. We want to start with a special thank you to our medal sponsors this year, starting with AMBT, LLC, Burrell, Tamra, Cusify, Bayer Crop Science, TriCal Group, Sataki, BM&M Screen Solutions, BASF, and the Ag Center. Sincere thank you to all of you. Your leadership and support of the California almond industry is greatly appreciated and valued. And we'd also like to thank Bayer Crop Science for sponsoring the 2023 Almond Leadership Program. We're excited to partner with them again in 2024. We wanna take a moment to recognize the Almond Leadership Program. This was one of the most competitive years ever and we know that those 17 exceptional professionals will make outstanding contributions to this industry in the future. Class members have pledged to raise $25,000 to support California Future Farmers of America. Thanks to our leadership program sponsor, Bayer Crop Science. Please give them a round of applause. And if anyone is interested in applying for the Almond Leadership Program, applications are due this Friday at 12.59 p.m. You can find information on almonds.com. That's almonds.com slash Almond Leadership Program for further information. It's been a great pleasure to meet many of you uh, in the past few months since I've been with the Almond Board and had the great pleasure to be out there in the field. I look forward to meeting many more of you this week and in the days and years ahead. As I understand, the industry is not in a good place. I had the opportunity to hear from you firsthand about the many challenges that you're facing and what's on your minds. And I know that many of you are just trying to survive to get through another year. Clarice, you're spot on. Last year, we talked about black swans, and after some reflection, it seems as though this industry was hit by an entire flock. You had COVID, the logistical nightmare, inflation, retaliatory tariffs, increased farming co costs, increased global competition and supply, low market pricing, and now we're a few years in, heading into what appears to be another year of tough economic times. All that being said, there is a silver lining, and it is that although these challenges are difficult, uh, they are no longer new, which means that we can now more clearly define them, which allows us to address them more effectively. Last year, we talked about changing times and the need to evolve to change with those times. And this year, we're gonna focus on how. How has the playing field changed? How do our strategies measure up? And how do we need to evolve to remain competitive? Both the staff and the board have been working feverishly to answer these questions. And from what we've learned, is that for the short-term outlook, things will remain difficult and tough decisions will have to be made. But for those that can hang on, and it is gonna take some time, we do believe there's good reason to remain optimistic about the future of almonds and their profitability. Today, we'll take a closer look at some of our more pressing issues and share what we've learned about each. Then we'll pivot to talk about the action that we've taken and then touch on a little bit of where we plan on focusing our efforts moving forward. To begin, we've invited economist David Magania from Rabobank back this year to bring us up to date on the macro aspects of the national and global economies and how they've evolved over the past 12 months, and then give him the opportunity to share his thoughts on how he thinks this will impact you and your operations. Please join me in welcoming David Magania. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you for the intro. And the fact that you invited me back, that means that I didn't get in trouble last year. <laughs> so I hope I don't get in trouble this year either. So uh, for um, easy topic, economic outlook, right? So um, to say that the past few seasons have been challenging for the almond industry is an understatement for many of you. And uh, we, we, we understand all the challenges that you guys have been going through. So today we'll be analyzing what has changed and what is the outlook for the next uh, few seasons. So first off, I will start with uh, making a reference to a song title and trying to make a, um, a recount of what happened a year ago, we were still discussing logistic constraints, deficit irrigation, we were in the middle of a severe drought, input prices was in everybody's mind, and lack of availability of containers was a topic of everyday conversation. And this year, we went from, uh, over the past 12 months, we've been discussing uh, seemingly opposite uh, situations. So now going from being an, in a too dry environment to a too wet environment. So atmospheric rivers, pollination challenges, and going from deficit irrigation to making the most out of water recharge and El Nino phenomenon that is expected to remain in place for the next few uh, months will continue to shape the, uh, um, the weather outlook. One additional uh, aspect that is new to this, insect damage that now this year has become a relevant, uh, relevant problem in the industry. So a lot of changes over the past 12 months. But at the same time, and some of you will get this musical reference as well, uh, seems like on the macro side, we continue to have, uh, we're in a different year but we're still talking about persistent inflation, elevated interest rates, consumers still trading down, sticky consumer prices, and many economists continue to see a potential recession in the cards. So that's in terms of the uh, macro environment. As for the industry, still we discussed demand challenges, uh, elevated almond carry out despite of having uh, lighter crops, and favorable weather, as I said, either if it's too dry or too wet. Price pressures and margin uh, pressures are um, uh, quite uh, relevant as well. So having said that, I will touch on just a brief review of all the macroeconomic uh, indicators. And one is inflation continues to be a um, topic. 24 months ago, the question was, is this inflationary environment gonna be transitory? Now we know the answer, it was not. So now we see a lot of impact on consumer uh, behavior and consumer expectations, consumer confidence, and we see consumer savings declining. But we have seemingly contradictory uh, signals. Just uh, last quarter, so we saw the strongest economic growth in the past two years. And that was because of very resilient consumer expenditure. We will see how much of that is in, 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 it's been put in credit cards and how that may impact consumer confidence and consumer behavior in the next uh, year or so. Another topic that continues to be uh, on everybody's mind is uh, interest rates. As you see here, we came from a very low, uh, an, an environment of very low interest rates, and we've seen interest rate increasing uh, higher and faster than many anticipated over the past uh, few uh, 18 months. But still, if you put that things, uh, things in perspective, still interest rates are at, at historical averages. So what are the uh, expectations? Here, this chart was created uh, based on the dot plot chart, which is the expectations uh, on interest rates in the next few months. And you see a big variance between 
uh, these uh, um, uh, decision makers uh, in terms of what to expect in terms of uh, interest rates in the future. There is still a possibility of even higher interest rates in the next few months. And one point to notice is that nobody is expecting interest rates to go back to zero in, uh, in, the, in the next few years. So that's uh, basically, we can summarize that higher interest rates for a longer period of time. And I know that impacts the way uh, we make decisions, particularly to invest and innovate and, uh, in the industry. These uh, um, higher interest rates obviously have an impact on um, economic growth prospects. And here we have an estimate from October. And one point to uh, notice is that for 2024, still you see all year-on-year uh, -year variations are still in positive territory. Obviously, we have a lot of divergence in, ter in terms of different countries and by, um, uh, by quarter, but uh, still seems like soft landing will be possible after all. This is just one estimate, but I've seen some other estimates for the U.S. economy that are not so optimistic. So still, there is a likely uh, pro probability that in the, in the first half of 2024, we see uh, a recession not too deep and hopefully uh, not too long, and, uh, but the best scenario would be not to have a recession at all. So that's uh, the economic prospects. And just like to re uh, quickly review uh, another uh, key variable, which is interest rate, uh, exchange rates. And you see that uh, just a little bit more than a year ago, the dollar, the strength of the dollar reached a historically high against many currencies. Since then, at the beginning of 2023, we saw dollar depreciating against some currencies, which favored the competitiveness of almond exports. However, now we've seen the dollar strengthening again, uh, particularly against the Indian rupee. So good thing that they remove, they were able to remove the retaliatory tariffs going into India because uh, 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 the dollar is quite strong against the Indian rupee and Chinese yuan, Euro, Japanese yen. And the only, the, um, the only difference is the Mexican peso. The Mexican peso has been quite strong. So now uh, it's a good opportunity to export more almonds into Mexico. And the reason, one reason behind this is that in Mexico, they have increased the interest rates faster than in the US. Just 18 months ago, the differential between the U.S. interest rate and the Mexican interest rate was uh, 200 basis points. Now it's 600 basis points. So we're expecting the similar exchange rates for the next uh, 18 months. Going back to what we reviewed a year ago, uh, uh, logistics seems like this is a thing of the past. And so one Seems like this is one less thing to worry about. Let's hope that uh, transportation cost remains at, uh, keeps uh, declining at a good level. Another point is uh, very light surprises. And you see, uh, this is the affordability index. Obviously, if it's above zero, it's more affordable because this is an index created. It's a basket of fertilizer uh, relative to the price of the a basket of commodities. So still, fertilizer affordability index to enter 2024 in positive territory. So those are some piece, uh, some a couple of pieces of good news. But that is, as my kids would say, that that is so 2022. 2023, we're still discussing about consumers trading down, and you see consumers uh, shifting channels, trading down or trading out. So not buying things that are non-necessities or things like that. Also, uh, supermarkets adjusting, and they also are taking um, some strategies. Some data beha behind this is just like how much consumers are spending at retail. Uh, so you see here, uh, expenditure traffic plus basket uh, uh, for different types of supermarkets and discount grocers they have the highest uh, growth or rate 
in all 2022. And if we see the numbers for the first three quarters of 2023, you see similar trends. So consumers continue to trade down. One challenge that uh, I've, I've gotten this question a lot, how can we drive demand when uh, retail prices of tree nuts and retail prices for almonds remain elevated? So basically, we don't see uh, that the lower prices that the growers are getting is being reflected at retail level. So this is a typical example of asymmetric price transmission and something, um, 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 this is an area of opportunity in terms of negotiation and industry structure. So to conclude, I will try back to musical reference and not, tr uh, not trying to be too corny here, but definitely I know that these are challenging times but it won't be like this for long. Uh, it's just a matter of time until things get uh, better. And I think you guys need to be proud of what you guys are doing, implementing all the efficiencies, all the innovations uh, needed to remain in the industry. And I still, I'm, I'm still optimistic about the future of the industry in the longer run. So with this, I uh, appreciate your attention. So thank you for having me. Thank you for coming back. It's always a pleasure. Okay, so you shared a lot of information today. If there was one takeaway you could leave everyone with, what would it be? Always the easy question, right? Okay. <laughs> so um, one thing is um, in the industry, a lot of challenges. And one more challenge is to identify the business cycles where the industry is. Mm -hmm. And this is not exclusive to the, to the almond industry. It seems like uh, at one point, a decade ago, I remember a title of a report that said uh, when dollar, the, the price of almonds was $4 per pound, they said, it seems like money do grow on trees, <laughs> right? Uh, and then, uh, obviously, uh, the industry uh, overplanted, and that is not exclusive to almonds. I've been in a lot of uh, industry uh, events. Just yesterday, I was in the state of Washington, and they were discussing probably we're producing too many apples. So when you go and you check uh, table grapes, wine grapes, raisin grapes, walnuts, almonds, things like that, seems like it's too much production. So that's ironic given that probably we're too good at we have the right conditions to grow and uh, producing too much food. Is that positive? I don't know. But anyway, so just identifying where the business cycle is, that's a challenge and where you can do things in a more efficient way mm -hmm. to remain uh, profitable and uh, growing in this industry. Great. Thank you so much, David. It is always a pleasure to Thank see you. you. Thank you for Take having care. me. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to drill down into some of the specific issues and economic forces that are affecting our industry. One that's been impacting all of the American economy, and very specifically the almond industry, is the dramatic change in consumer behavior after COVID. To help us understand everything that's happening, please welcome Buddy Ketchner, founder and vice president of Studio 1157 and former CEO of Sterling Rice Partners. He's monitored consumer trends and the almond industry for decades. Welcome, buddy. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's nice to see some friendly faces out there um, from, from being here in times past. W what I want to do is talk about consumers, consumer behaviors, attitudes, because there's a lot of people right now that are going, what in the heck is going on? Like, they seem to be acting really differently than they've acted in the past. Is this forever? When will things get back to normal? What even is normal? And so what I'm going to do is take a couple minutes and dig into this a little bit and see if we can't unravel this. So the first thing is welcome to the turbulent 20s. There was a time when a lot of people right before the pandemic was kind of coming to a conclusion, people were going, it's going to be the roaring 20s. It's going to be this world global party. Everyone will be so happy and so relieved. They're going to get out there and spend and party and connect with everybody. And it's going to be just this amazing experience. And I can't wait for that to happen. That day is not today. 
Now, I'm an optimist, and I kind of hope and believe that we might still get some of the, uh, the Roaring Twenties coming up here in a little bit. But why are we not experiencing it today? Because a lot of people said that that would be here. So let's look a closer look. The other thing that people have said is that people, consumer behavior and attitudes have been permanently changed because of the pandemic. I actually don't buy that. And I think it's not a helpful thing to say because then you don't know what to do. I think if you break down consumer behavior, you can break it down into two buckets. And the first bucket is really temporary behaviors. These are temporary behavior changes that were either forced or funded because of a very specific situation. So an example is cooking at home versus eating out. There was a time when that was your only option, right? Funded behaviors are things like stimulus checks or spending the diverted money that you're not spending in other places, or in the case that we just talked about with inflation, defunding. So these things are temporary. And my belief is that a lot of temporary behaviors that have been forced or funded will start to look more like they did before once those conditions move away. But also interestingly, is behaviors that I believe are accelerated behaviors. Most of these, I would say all of these behaviors, started before the pandemic. They didn't originate in the pandemic, but they've been accelerated, and they continue to accelerate, and those will be more lasting. And so as we look at the changes we're navigating, and you think about a short-term and long-term horizon, it's helpful to break them into those two buckets, because then you know how to address them. So in the next seven minutes, I'm going to identify eight consumer behavior changes that I think are particularly relevant to the almond industry. And I'm going to take a crack at drawing out some of the implications and possible things that the almond industry could do for your consideration to help navigate through it. Now, one of the things that makes this tricky is that some of these changes seem paradoxical. They absolutely seem like they're in contention with each other. And that's okay because when we get to the end and you start to see the whole, you have a much clearer path on how to get through them. So let's go. Number one. David talked about this ad nauseum. I don't need to talk about it anymore. People are prioritizing value to manage inflation. They absolutely are. We're not out of inflation yet. There was a lot of us that hoped we would be. We're still in it. And they are doing the things that you would expect people to do in this situation. They're eliminating non-essential spending. They're trading down private label. They're destocking their pantries now that the supply chain is strong. So during the pandemic, they stocked their pantries and they bought a lot. Well, now they're almost just in time. They have it lower, and your manufacturing companies are doing this too. So we know this is happening. It's important, and people have adjusted their behavior because of that. And or but, they're also spending, and they're spending a lot, and they're splurging, but they're doing it very selectively. There is a massive sense of crisis fatigue out there. People are tired of all the bad news. They're tired of every single day something else comes along. And what they have is desire for moments of joy, moments of happiness. And so impulse purchases are up. And instant gratification, this notion of I want to live for the moment. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I want to have a moment today are actually strong. And so what does that look like? A lot of premium products are doing very well right now. And those services and brands that lean into indulgence and premium and treating myself are doing well. These include eating out, travel, anything that's about connecting a community. So what does this mean for us? This means if you are a high-priced, non-essential, non-premium item, you're vulnerable. However, if you have a portfolio of products that live at a value level, and deliver great value and live products that live at an indulgent and premium level, you can actually do really well. And the danger is being stuck in the middle. But the ends are doing well, which gives us a suggestion or thought on how to think about portfolio management. All right, number three. In times of uncertainty, big brands dominate because we always tend to go back to what's familiar when we're feeling uncertain. And so big food brands during the pandemic did really, really well. Some of them grew 50% at the height of the pandemic, which is phenomenal. So what does that mean for the almond industry? It means a couple of things. It is really important that almonds remain favored and have a favored position in the role of big companies and big brand products. It also means that the almonds and the almond industry have to be part of their new product innovation because there's tremendous growth. So we have to be there for now and also for the future, which means it's really important that they hear our message and they know our message and they know our benefits because there's a lot of people out there competing for that space. We have to make sure that almonds are top of mind because we've got a great story. They just have to hear it. And so continuing to focus there is really important. 
and paradoxically at the other side of it, people are switching in a way they never have before. We have reduced brand loyalty, probably the lowest brand loyalty that I've seen in the last 30 years. There's brand switching everywhere. And especially within the younger audiences, your Gen Z and your millennials, they're five times more likely to try a new brand if it seems like it has a benefit or aligns with their values or has something that they like. They have no qualms about switching. And so brand switching is huge. And what that means for us is that we have to be relevant and compelling to the new brands and the younger, more experiential audiences. So we have to be it's kind of in with the old and in with the new. And so again, the same thing is that the almond industry needs to make sure that the new brands see us as on trend and relevant and exciting, as well as the old brands, which is a great opportunity for us because we've got the story. It's about making sure it's communicated. Number five, omni-channel shopping. This is something that started before the pandemic and blew up. And what in the world does omni-channel shopping mean? It means this mashup of the online and the offline world. And we know that during the pandemic, people started buying all kinds of stuff online because they didn't go into stores. This is not going away. In fact, it's accelerating and changing. And there are now many, many paths of purchase or paths or journeys um, uh, consumer journeys than there have been before. So it's not uncommon for someone to actually use three different channels before making a purchase. They might see something that's really cool on their Instagram feed or their social media feed of some kind. They might research it online. They might look at it in store. They might buy it online. They might buy it in store. They might have it delivered. And so that omni-channel connection, that different way of shopping is really profound. And so when we think about how people buy things from discovery to research to order to delivery to pickup, the implication for the almond industry is that we need to be present at every step of this journey. We need to know how to impact it everywhere, but it's not an online offline world. It's a mashup and this is only going to continue to grow. So we have to have a seamless omni-channel mindset so that we're thinking about how consumers act in a very different way than maybe they would have in the past. Brick and mortar is not going away and online is not going away, but it's a really dynamic place. Number six, sustainability and affordability. 84% of global consumers say sustainability is very important in their purchase decision. And 50% are not sure they would pay a premium in the time of inflation. So this is a really rough place to be. And what does that mean? What it means is that it's currently it's very hard to win on sustainability. But it's very easy to lose because people will switch. And in a world of switching, the opportunity for the almond industry is to make sure that we are understood to be both good for you and good. And again, we have the story to tell. And if we tell the story in the right way, and if we can make this known amongst these brands, the big brands, the small brands, and everybody in between, we have the potential to support and protect the downside before it becomes an upside. Number seven, a broader definition of health. Everybody's talked about this. It used to be January 1, people would do their resolutions and it largely had to do with losing weight. It has not anything to do with losing weight anymore. The biggest resolution is about mental health. It's about managing anxiety and depression and better sleep and concentration. And so mental health is a huge part of the definition of health. And it's heavily influenced by food and it's heavily influenced by exercise and other things. Physical health, obviously, the stuff we know, disease prevention, performance, weight loss, all that stuff. And finally, the third is this notion of food as medicine. And this is very strong in Asia, but it's getting stronger in the US. This sense that we can prevent, treat, optimize through food. And so the, ne the whole definition of food is in a dynamic, really exciting place. And the implications are, there's a huge opportunity for us to continue to build the almond health story. So we can be a natural health and wellness powerhouse. It's a huge equity that we have now. It can be a huge equity going forward across an entirely new set of dimensions that work together. Number eight, this one started before the pandemic and it's accelerated dramatically. It's not going away. People keep asking, is it going to go away? I don't think so. Remote hybrid work is here to stay. Remote work, fully remote work, people working at home and never going in, peaked at over 50% during the pandemic. It was 6% before. It's about 28 to 30% now. And it's really interesting because almost every big company is urging people to return back to work. Zoom, who you've all used in your everyday life, is begging their people to come back to work three days a week, which I find really funny that they're like, you should all be doing remote work except for us. Um, 
But everyone is saying this is going to continue, this will grow. So what does this mean for us? It means a lot for us. Because now that people spend more time at home, how they snack and eat has changed. When we had on-the-go occasions, sitting at your desk eating on almonds, driving in your car, where portability and cleanliness and all this stuff was really important, now it's being replaced by at-home snacking occasions. And all of a sudden, the competitive side is entirely different because they have their refrigerator in their pantry. There's a whole generation of digital nomads, the younger folks, who are in the office a few days, but they're being in different places all the time. They're not even at home to snack. So the implication is that we need to understand these really, really closely. And we need to fit into these new routines and behaviors because they've changed. So I want to leave you with one last thought as we look at those eight things and how we navigate them. And this is it. When the pandemic started, I had the opportunity to, to talk to and meet a person who is an expert in pandemics. There was like three of those guys in the entire country. Now there's a few more. And he said there's a pattern in pandemics that repeat, because this is not the first time we've been through this. The first is they end. The second is there's a period of recovery. And the third is there's innovation and new thinking. And the best example ever is the Black Plague in Europe. And when it ended, finally, there was a period of recovery. And then came the Renaissance, which was an explosion of science and culture and technology and business and commerce and trade that redefined what was then the modern world. I believe we're somewhere in number two. We will come out of this recovery. What's really interesting is that I also believe we're going into number three. And if you read the papers and you read the news about the new technology that's here and coming, we're going to be in a very different world in a very short period of time. And so the opportunity for the almond industry is to lean into it and to understand it and to see it coming and lead through it and lead to a better future because it will be a very different future and it can be a better future. And as I said, I'm an optimist, and so I believe we're going to get some of those roaring 20s. I really hope we will, and, um, and I think the way to do it is to lead into it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, buddy. So you've either been a student or a teacher of this industry for over 20 years. Yep. Um, what would you characterize as the almond industry's greatest strength? Wow. Well, first of all, let me say I think you've got a lot of great strengths. It's a great question. And when you look at all of this and you look at things and industries that go through times of very profound change, there's a lot, but I'd, I'd highlight two things that I think are enormous strengths for the industry. The number one is purely at a product base, you have a fantastic product. The product is healthy, it's convenient, it's portable, it's storable, it holds up well as an ingredient, it's a perfect snack, it works in indulgence, it works at, at, the, uh, at a health level. There's so many ways that the product is almost the perfect food. And there's lots of industries that can't say that. But the product is great. And the second is, is the power of geography. And some people talk about geography as being determinism. Everything is in the Central Valley. You have the opportunity to visit your neighbors in one day, to drive from north to south and talk to everybody. And what that gives you the opportunity to do is to be aligned and focused as an industry, which means you're quicker, you're more responsive. And if you can get organized and continue to be organized, you can make really, really good things happen in ways that under other industries can't because they can't seem to agree on anything. You guys have the power to agree and to focus. And that's a huge strength. I love that. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. It's great to see you. All right, so up next, another influence and sometimes headwind in our industry comes from our own family, the Nutt family. And in a way, Richard Waycott and Bryce Spicer are going to come on stage and talk to you about where we are with the nut industry and how we are influencing our own outcomes. Richard and Bryce, welcome to the stage, please. God, I should just read it. <laughs> I should just read it. How are you, Bryce? Doing well. It's good to be on stage with you again. Yeah, good to be here. You ready to do this? Ready or not. Okay. You know, one thing I swore off for the rest of my life was never to follow, follow Buddy Kutchner. Oh. <laughs> In terms of a presentation, but here we are once again. Here we so are. it's all up to you to keep people smiling here. Anyhow, Bryce and I would very much like to add our welcome to uh, the Almond Conference yeah. 2023. Thank you all for attending. Uh, we're going to delve into some numbers here after hearing uh, some of the macro information that David presented and the very uh, interesting and I think inspiring presentation that Buddy made. Um, with that, we're, we're going to touch on sort of the, the greater ambience in which 
we find ourselves our environment around the world in the tree nut business. We're not alone in the almond world. Uh, and it's important for us to realize what's happening in terms of growth, production, additional plantings, et cetera, with the other tree nuts with which we, you know, we, we uh, live with but also compete with. Also, uh, going back to some of what um, was spoken about with David and Buddy, uh, some of the converging factors that have come together to create sort of the situation in which we find ourselves. And that gets into the oversupply word uh, <laughs> that's out there a lot these days, the overplanting world, as well as the carrion uh, world and, 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 and number that's being obviously talked about a lot. Um, and we'll put that into just yeah. sort of a different perspective of, of uh, how you might want to consider it and look at it. Then lastly, I just did want to touch on tariffs uh, and sort of what's happened since uh, the retaliatory tariffs came into effect, one of those converging factors that's uh, affected us. So uh, following that, we'll get into a lot of the analysis that Bryce does so well. So with that, we'll get started. Uh, so let's start with almonds. This is 10 years of production. Uh, here in the valley and around the world. So you're seeing California in, in blue and rest of world in orange. And obviously it tracks very well what, what happens in California. Yeah. Uh, basically affects the world supply, obviously. Uh, but I think the interesting thing is that over time, the California share of supply has slightly gone down. So we're at 75, according to this, these, this data, 75% of global production today uh, versus uh, about 80% uh, and not too long ago. So obviously that's increasing uh, the competitive environment that's out there. Um, we have about 3.5 billion pounds of almonds being produced right now. Uh, and that's about a billion more than it was 10 years ago. So again, there's been a lot of supply that's um, come into the world market. This is looking uh, largely at the same uh, data, uh, but it divides it among some of the countries that are producing. Uh, especially the more important ones like Spain and Australia. So uh, if you look uh, at the gray and yellow uh, lines in the bars there, you'll see sort of how the Spanish and Australian crops have increased in terms of their percentage. And the orange is obviously California, and then there are many others. I think the thing that I reflect on here, and of course you hear this going around the world, talking to customers everywhere, is sort of the, the sometimes erratic nature of our industry. Uh, and Bryce will talk more about that with yields. But uh, you know, when, when our crop goes from 3.1 down to 2.5, uh, that's a big drop. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, when Spain uh, has a frost or a freeze uh, and half the crop disappears, that's a big change. So we do have a, a, a world supply that, that goes through a lot of oscillation from time to time and uh, something to keep into effect or, or in, in, in mind. So this looks at the um, top five uh, producers outside of the U.S. Uh, and it just compares uh, 10 years ago to where we are today. Uh, and I think, uh, interestingly, really, uh, Australia and Spain have pretty much grown together with that global supply. So yeah. they're, they're sharing pretty much the same percentages that they did several years ago. But on the smaller origins, you're seeing some pretty interesting changes uh, with Turkey uh, growing to 7% of global supply uh, and Iran and, and Tunisia leaving the scene, going into the other group, uh, and uh, Morocco and Portugal coming on the scene. So it's quite interesting how uh, there's been quite a shift in sort of the smaller origins uh, over the last few years. And then if you add up um, all of the European countries that produce almonds, some of them aren't featured here on this graph, they're in the other column. But uh, European supply was 33% in 2014 of other production around the world. It's now 41%. So just an interesting thing to keep in mind as the European origin supply starts growing uh, or continues to grow, uh, just the competitive nature that that sets up for an exported uh, almond from California. Um, now this slide's a little bit complicated, so bear <laughs> with me. I want you to start with the red line that goes across the top. That represents the total production of tree nuts, and it has more than what's uh, on the top of, of the graph here in terms of tree nuts. It's got all of them in there, including almonds. But you want to keep on the left in terms of the left axis. So that red line starts at about 7.5 billion pounds. And if you end up on the right where it is and go all the way to the left, you're at about 12.5 billion pounds. So we have, since 2014-15, increased the total tree nut supply in the world by about 5 billion yep, 5 pounds. Billion, yeah. uh, so again, 
you got to keep in mind when we're talking about the almond market and almond competitive uh, competition, as well as choices that consumers can make because they have a, a more of an abundance of some of these other tree nuts, it's something that uh, is important uh, as we look at our strategies at the almond board. That's a 64% uh, increase in global production in 10 years. And the other lines, um, you read off of the right-hand axis, uh, those are obviously walnuts, hazelnuts, cashews, pistachios. Uh, obviously the cashew line, I think, is the, the most, uh, you know, one that increases the most here, going from, again, you gotta read it off the right, but increasing quite significantly from about one and a half uh, uh, billion pounds now up to uh, 2.4. So we're seeing some major uh, increases in certain nuts. Others, like hazelnuts, yes, increasing, but certainly not to the same extent. Um, now, now we're going to switch to per capita consumption because that's always something that we watch very closely at the Almond Board. That's really an index or an indice that demonstrates if we're making progress with the consumers or not. And on the left, you'll see almond uh, domestic uh, consumption per capita, which has increased very nicely over the last few years. We saw a bit of a blip here with the COVID and, and, and Buddy was alluding to that. So we have had a couple of down years here domestically, but definitely have had quite a, a run at per capita uh, consumption increasing uh, to about 2.5 pounds per person now, a little bit below that. Uh, same thing took place with some of the other tree nuts you can look at there, uh, pistachios, pecans, uh, et cetera where they were gradually increasing production per, or consumption per capita and also suffered a little decline through COVID. I think what's interesting is, you know, we're at 2.15, if these, these numbers are representing today, <laughs> in terms of per capita consumption. And that, uh, and our nearest competitor is on the far right there, the cashew at 1.23 pounds per, per, per capita. So uh, we still enjoy a, a hefty lead in terms of uh, domestic per capita consumption. And then when we lay on that uh, global consumption per capita, so it's just changing the divisor here by the global population, you'll see we're at about a half a pound per person around the world, uh, which far exceeds, again, the other tree nuts uh, today in terms of, of that uh, uh, per capita consumption. So two things I take from this. Number one, good job, you know, we're, we're ahead of, of the other tree nuts. Number two, man, what, what a potential we have to increase per capita consumption in other countries. And we certainly are achieving that uh, in, in certain places. Uh, but I think as the Almond Board works on its programs around the world, you've got to keep this in mind, you know. Uh, we, we've got a lot more almonds that people can be consuming to drive these numbers to better places. And I think this just reflects all the work that you've done and, and, and this organization's done and many other entities to really, um, you know, drive that healthy lifestyle change. We've seen the growth in middle class and, and disposable income, new product development, broader distribution, and promotional and educational efforts uh, that have caused uh, this growth to take place. So uh, well done, but we've got obviously a big job ahead of us still. So before Bry Bryce dazzles us <laughs> with his numbers, and he, he always fascinates me, uh, gotta love that smile too. Um, but let's reflect quickly sort of on what's taken pla place the last eight years uh, when we look at this index. And I think it's sort of interesting. Again, it's been talked about a little bit by David, a little bit by, by uh, Buddy. Uh, but here's some marks in time where we see 16, 17, we had the first retaliatory tariffs. Those were the, the steel and aluminum ones. Then in 2017, 18, we had the 301. The, those are the, are the, the tariffs that we put in on uh, this whole host of billions of dollars of Chinese imports. Then we have COVID, then we have the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and then we end up sort of where we are today. And so just sort of to tell this story, uh, when we look at crop receipts and uh, crop sh or net shipments over that time, pretty much tracked, and this is an index, so it's just showing how it went up from a, a base of zero uh, or down. And we see that we tracked really well, really shipping what we grew, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got in these last couple of years and you see the yellow line exceeding the red one. And that's indicating we're, we're not quite keeping up um, with, with the crop uh, during those years. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, we add to that, um, and again, you'll see this whole thing starts to shift to the right. 
But the crude oil pr uh, prices uh, and the impact that, that obviously the, the invasion of Ukraine had on that, we talk about uh, how that's reflected in the cost of nitrogen. Uh, then we look at freight from the West Coast to China and freight rates at that time. We look at the ships that were lining up off of Los Angeles to unload containers full of the stuff you bought and we <laughs> bought and then race back to China to get some more uh, without taking almonds with them. That was going on at that time. Uh, and then uh, that contributed a lot of those things and the huge crops we had, right, yeah. to this yellow line that I just uh, put on the screen, which is our carry-in inventory. So you can see how all this stuff just converged sort of at the same time, unfortunately. You imagine if all that hadn't happened, yeah. <laughs> where we might be today. But that's sort of the reality we, we've lived through. And then, of course, as David was mentioning, we had this totally erratic a financial situation where we had interest rates increasing, we hit COVID, they drove them down to zero, and then boom, back up to uh, well exceed where we've been in recent history, where, where they are today. So we just wanted to illustrate this again about sort of why, what contributed to sort of this excess inventory that we're dealing with today, uh, some of those factors and how they converged. And then here is going to that carry out inventory and sort of the, uh, the gray area there, which is where uh, that excess, if yeah. you want to call it that. Yeah. So we wanted to take just a second to put this in, a, in perspective, and I'm going to ask Bryce to, to take us through some numbers here. Yeah, so the shaded area that you see there, that's the delta between receipts and shipments, and that's what carries down to the carryout. So if you look back over the last number of years, in 1920, uh, we were at 450 million pounds carryout. You, you move forward a year, 608, uh, the, we were at 837 a year ago, and then 800 this year. And to put that in context, prior to these few years here, the five-year average before that was about 362 million pounds. And so, you know, to put that in context, if you take the 800 that we have carry out and you subtract what was the average before that time period, you're really dealing with about 438 million pounds. And Richard, putting that into context, about, you know, how much is that? It's about two months of our shipments, right? About two months of our shipments, and I think uh, just going back prior to the run-up in our inventories, we, we wanted that much inventory. Yeah. We wanted 350, 400 million pounds. We had to get through August and September and into, and into October uh, with old crop and a mix of new crop. And so that was a healthy number. So really the excess we have is more yeah. or less uh, in these lines, and that's about two months of shipment. So yeah. if we keep shipping at the, the clip that we are right now, we start eating into that at a more rapid pace, and we can uh, hopefully take it down to a healthy number in the year to come. Just another way to look at it, going back to that per capita consumption, yeah. if that 438 million pounds was to be consumed in the U.S., it would be about 1.3 pounds per person additional. I'm sure we all could eat that much, but it's probably <laughs> not going to happen. Challenging. But exactly. if you look at it across the globe, it's one ounce a year, one handful of almonds a year more yeah. around the world to get rid of that number. Yeah. So I think keeping these things in mind of sort of where we can go with trying to, uh, to mitigate some of these issues is, is a good thing to keep to, to look at. Lastly, um, for me, and, and then I'll pass it over to Bryce, but looking at the, the sort of tariff case study, I think is really interesting. And we have with us today Ambassador McCaleb, who'll be up on the stage here in a minute, who's the chief uh, agricultural uh, negotiator for the United States of America. So we've, we've had lots of discussions, believe me, about these things. But this shows um, our, uh, our exports to Turkey, uh, to China, Hong Kong, and to India. Uh, the, the access is on the left in terms of millions of pounds. And it shows what, what happened at these sort of major events of tariff implementations, COVID, et cetera. And you see on the bottom, Turkey, uh, basically we had uh, a pretty steady increase there despite the retaliatory that went into effect. Uh, India on the top side, uh, it was only six cents a kilo that the retaliatory tariff was for inshell, so it really wasn't that big an economic factor, and we took off. Uh, really, the, the retaliatory tariff there did not uh, impact us too much, but thanks very much to Ambassador McCaleb and a lot of other people that worked on this, uh, those, uh, that, that tariff was removed uh, this summer. The real impact has been China because obviously the 301 tariffs only affected China. And you can see what happened to our volume there where we lost, uh, I think it's about 40% uh, of our volume, wasn't it, in the first, uh, uh, first time there. So uh, that was real impact. If we look, and I know we have some of our very uh, uh, appreciated and, 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 and uh, beloved Australian uh, uh, industry members here today and uh, just want to share really what Australia did in this situation because it's important. 
Uh, Australia, um, with their tariff situation, obviously not tied to us, uh, did increase their shipments to, um, to Turkey by about 300% uh, over that time, just in recent, here, recent time. Uh, when we look at India, not so much. Um, they basically uh, uh, went up and down a bit, but didn't really increase too much until very recently when on January 1st, uh, the, in, the Indians and the, the, the uh, Australians agreed to a partial trade uh, reduction of 50% off of the rates. So they t today have a 50% advantage against us into that market. So we'll see what happens in the future. Um, the real impact was China. And if you look back uh, in 1617, uh, Australia didn't imp export anything there. They have a free trade agreement, they're at zero. We're at about 25% today. Uh, and so uh, they have now come pretty close to our volume going into China. So it's just interesting to look at what the, the impact of these tariffs can be. Sometimes you think everything's gonna stop or slow down. Yeah. Not always the case uh, because it's a dynamic situation, but uh, we definitely wanna get the Chinese tariff uh, corrected uh, and continue to grow that market. So, um, Let's get to some of the funner stuff, I think, uh, Bryce. It. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you over 13 years. Uh, I've gone a bit grayer, <laughs> like a lot grayer. Not your fault. Uh, you've gone a lot balder. He a had lot, hair yeah. when <laughs> yeah, true. He had hair when I started. <laughs> I have pictures. Um, but I also want to congratulate you on being uh, accepted as an inductee into the. Uh, 53rd class of the Ag Leadership Program, Thank California you. Ag Leadership Program Thank this you. year. So. That's a, it's a real honor, and we're really thrilled that, uh, that you were accepted for that program. Um, so we've seen a lot of crazy things with numbers and yields and everything. Yeah. Um, so nobody better to, uh, than you to make sense of it. So clicker over all to right, you. All right, let's dive right in here. We'll start with acreage. Let's look at some acreage trends. And uh, this is all data from the Land IQ 2023 standing acreage final estimate that came out a couple weeks ago. And the headline really here is, is for the second year in a row, we see total almond acreage decreasing over the year previous. Uh, you can see it's down about 100,000 uh, acres on the total acreage side. It is up slightly on the bearing acreage side, but the big story here is the decrease we see in non-bearing acres in two years. You can see it's almost half uh, of what it was back in 2021. And really what's driving this, obviously new plantings, uh, the trends in new plantings, and also removals. Uh, you know, as published by Land IQ, we see removals in 22 that were larger than 21, and removals in 23 that were larger than 22. So, you know, Richard, if these kind of trends were to continue, where, at, where do you see, you know, bearing acreage going from here? Well, it's a big question, isn't it? Yeah, uh, right. And obviously it's impacted by the economic prosperity of the industry yeah. and, and how that uh, uh, develops, hopefully, uh, um, uh, David Magania has yeah. some good news <laughs> yeah. coming up for us there. Um, but also, obviously, Sigma, and we haven't talked yeah. about that very much, but it's obviously now really coming into view more closely, and it is uh, in implementation, basically. Yeah. So that's a, still an 18 to 20 year you know, time frame of getting that fully implemented, so it's hard to see what the more immediate impacts are, but obviously uh, certain acreage will come out of production in California, exactly where that is, how much that is, and when it happens is gonna, is gonna, gonna unfold uh, due to all the, the, the reasons we mentioned. But uh, definitely, uh, uh, there probably will be a lot of pressure on certain acreage coming out. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at production, and obviously at production we're looking at average yield times a bearing acre, and I think as we look at production over this time horizon here, the last 30 years or so, it's helpful to look at it from the status of different milestones that the industry's been through. Uh, I'm going to put here the first milestone of our first billion pound crop, which happened in 2002-2003 crop year, and you can see the story working up to that is one of increasing bearing acreage as signified in the green uh, line that you see on your chart, and then a trend line of yield increase, and albeit with some certain peaks and valleys during that period of time. Uh, fast forward nine years to our next milestone of two billion pounds in the 2011-12 crop year, and you really see much of the same. You see increasing bearing acreage, you see some, a trend line, if I were to lay a trend line over that blue uh, average yield across the state, also increasing. But since that two billion pound crop year, we've seen a, a bit of a change, and that's what's signified here uh, in the next nine years prior to uh, our three billion pound crop, which happened in the 2020-21 crop year. And if you look at the blue dotted line here, this would represent the average yield trend uh, since that two billion pound crop in the 2011-12 crop year. And what we see is that yields are 
uh, under pressure and actually decreasing over that time horizon. Obviously, the 2020-21 crop year with an average state yield of about 2,500 pounds was an outlier on that trend line here. Um, but the other thing I find interesting about this is this is all in the context of, of tighter tree densities in our orchard. You know, as reported by NAS at early in 2000, there's about 100 trees per acre. If you look at now, it's about 125. So, you know, we see 25% more trees to, to, the, uh, to each acre, but we see yields continuing to be under pressure, certainly as of late. So to put this in a little bit more context, let's look at some different yield scenarios. And I'll lay over here uh, a drought scenario from 2006 to uh, 0910. Uh, and you can see that it's a bit difficult to approximate a trend line for yield here. It's a bit of like a bell curve. Uh, one thing I'll say, this is before the almond industry started funding a spatial mapping uh, with land IQ. And so some of the variations in yield you can be seeing from these numbers could be attributed to some bearing acreage uncertainty at that time. Uh, when you go forward, though, the next drought, uh, just following that 2 billion pound crop year, we do start to see that, again, that trend of yields being under pressure and a decreasing uh, yield. Now, there, because bearing, bearing acreage was increasing over this time, you can see that the production, overall production in orange there, was more or less fairly flat during this period, but it was really a story of decreasing yields and incre uh, being offset by increasing bearing acreage. And then most recently, uh, if you look at just the last three years here, it's hard to, it's hard to fathom, but we were in a drought and, you know, at the beginning part of this. Obviously, last winter has removed us from that, but we've encountered the drought conditions. We've encountered a significant frost event. And then, of course, the adverse bloom conditions that the industries went through this last February. So we see even more increasingly uh, yields under pressure here. And obviously, the 23 crop, we don't know what the yield will end up being. Uh, if it does come in below what the estimated one is that you see on the chart here, that could potentially only further steepen the the, uh, the slope you see on the trend line there. Richard, what are your thoughts on yield? Are you, are you seeing similar things around the world with other tree nuts? Well, that's what I said. I think the erratic nature, especially recently, yeah. uh, we were over in Spain a couple of years ago, right, right, uh, uh, sort of in their springtime, and, and we saw a whole the half of the country that didn't have one nut on it yeah. because yeah. of the frost or the freeze they had. Uh, and obviously, uh, this last year, Australia. Uh, came up way short of yeah. where they thought they were going to be. Right. So, uh, yeah, we've had some funny yield things going on uh, sort of everywhere in all the production producing countries. Okay, last chart here on the supply side, then we'll switch to demand and shipments. Uh, again, we'll look at these in, in trends here. So if you look at that trend from the 1 billion pound milestone to 2 billion pound, we see consistent growth, about 7% compound annual growth rate during that period, about 100 million pounds a year. Then during some of those drought years, we see more moderate growth, about 2.5% annual growth. And then really since 1819, we see 800 million, more than 800 million pounds added over the span of two years, and then 500 million pounds uh, taken away over the next two years. So quite a bit of change over the last year. And again, as other speakers have talked about, a lot going on in the world over these last few years as well. So let's shift uh, gears here and talk a little bit about demand. And I think that a good place to start is at total shipments. And one thing that most people, when you look at this, we see that 2022-23 uh, crop year, the most recently fully completed crop year, was slightly down from the year previous. It was actually down just about 2.6%. Uh, but again, if you look at the trend line over 10 years, it's actually up here. It's up 32% over 10 years. And even though uh, it was down from 21-22 and 21-22 was down from the 3 billion pound crop year, uh, this year, the 22-23 marking year that just wrapped up, is the third largest shipments ever in the history of our industry. And if you look at that growth rate over the last decade, it's about 3% a year uh, growth. So we had the three largest production years and the three largest Exactly, years. yep. Uh, let's look at it more on domestic and exports. Typically, we see about a 30% domestic share and a 70% export share. That was skewed a little more domestic in the early part of this time horizon here. In 13-14, we saw the domestic share at 33% and export at 67 uh, this last year, we saw that at 28% uh, domestic and 72% export. And really, if you look at the domestic side of things, after growing at about 3.3% annually from 13, 14 through that 2020, 21 crop year, the last two years, we have seen a retraction of about 5.5% annually the last two years. And, and Richard, well, as we talk about domestic consumption, any, any input you'd want to share Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're very concerned about it. We've been focusing a lot of time on it, and, and we're, we're really trying to figure it out. I think a lot of things that Buddy talked about, yeah. and David, you know, the way people are, are buying things, uh, what the trade-offs they're making, the trading down they're making, the advent of our friend the oat <laughs> has been out there. <laughs> And uh, that certainly impacted uh, the growth of almond milk. So there have been a lot of, uh, yeah. sort of influences on that. And to Buddy's point, I think we have to be at whatever the eating occasions are yeah. going forward, you know. Yeah. And they may not be the traditional ones, but we have <laughs> to find out 
where to be, when to be, and with what product. Yeah. Speaking of products, let's look at domestic shipments here by product type. Uh, typically, we see this in shelled and manufactured. So, uh, and then the shelled line is a bit difficult to get to. You have to back out interhandled transfers and industry purchases on the position report to get to a true domestic shelled number. Uh, when we do that and we compare 10 years ago, what the manufactured total was about 68% of the total uh, domestic shelled. Fast forward to today, that's up to 80%. Uh, and this is important for a number of different reasons, but to Richard's point he just made, what we're starting to see since 2020-21 is we see domestic shelled category down 7% over that time horizon last two years and domestic manufactured uh, off 16%. Let's jump into exports here, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about exports in the context of our three largest export regions, uh, that being Asia Pacific, which has been the largest region, a lot of emerging markets here. We certainly talked at length about the growth in India, and we'll, we'll continue to do so. We see that market, or that region rather, being the largest export region since 1718, uh, with the one exception being the 1920 year. We, when you drop down to Western Europe and orange on this chart, you see that there's still growth there. A lot of these established markets just not growing quite at the same pace that we see on the Asia Pacific side. And then at the very bottom, you can see in the, line, in the green line, the Middle East and Africa. This is an exciting uh, region for us. If you look, it's almost doubled in the last 10 years. And Richard, I know you spent some time there. Any thoughts on that region? Well, I think it's just been exploding, and, and it's across a lot of countries, too. Yeah. Um, you know, when we look at the statistics of what Lebanon imports, yeah, right. what Libya's importing, yeah. you know, despite all their problems, it's quite astounding. And so we've seen 200 million to 400 million. That's about half of the U.S. consumption now relative to, to what they're, they're consuming. So very interesting. And it's really North Africa. Um, there are two things that are really missing on this graph. One is everything south of North Africa yeah. <laughs> yeah. in that continent, and South America is not here. Yeah. So uh, we really have two continents of the world yeah. uh, that should be on this map and do and should provide uh, future growth for the industry. Uh, speaking of Middle East Africa, we do have a new entry into our top 10 des export destinations. Uh, Morocco, that number 10, is new to the list this year. Uh, the U.S. obviously does continue to be our number one destination for shipments uh, in the 22-23 crop uh, year. India remains in the number one position, and Spain and China to follow, which has been the case for some time now. Uh, albeit, though, we'll look on the next slide, Spain and China, a smaller percentage of the export share than what we've seen uh, in the past. So let's look at that export share. This is comparing, this is 2013-14 crop year. And you can see when we look at Spain and China and Hong Kong together, it's 28% of the exports uh, that year went to those two destinations, whereas 8% went to India that year. Fast forward to the most recent year, uh, that 28% of Spain and China has moved now to 18%. So where did that 10% go? You see India moving from an 8% export share up to 18% export share. And others like the UAE holding strong, uh, Germany remaining in the top five, and as I just mentioned, Morocco coming in uh, as well. And then lastly, what I'll share is just uh, we'll look at exports by product type. So if you look at the position report, you'll see that we report exports shelled and, manu uh, shelled and in shell. We group uh, manufactured and products in with shelled for that purpose. But here I've broken it out just to take a look at it. If you look at the top 10 export destinations in 22-23, the shelled category shipments to those destinations has gone from about 70% down to 63% over that time horizon and manufactured for those same destinations has gone from 8% down to three. So what's taken up some of that share? Uh, it's the in-show line that we've talked about here. Uh, we've seen you know, that 66% growth uh, in India over the last five years, and that has further driven the in show share of the top 10 export destination shipments from about 23 up to 34 there. So. And with that, Richard, I'll just say thank you so much. It's a pleasure to serve each of you here at the Almond Board and to serve alongside you, Richard, for the last uh, 12 years. And uh, we really appreciate everything you've done and look forward to uh, the next chapter in your life. Okay, so, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>
Global Technical and Regulatory Affairs Vice President Julie Adams and the Chair of the Technical and Regulatory Affairs, uh, Jonathan Hoff, to come out. Great. Thank you, Alexi. Well, what a day. Another year, another conference, and we're still dealing with trade issues. Absolutely right, Julie. It seems like we take one step forward and two steps back. But we have had some wins recently that probably not a lot of people have heard about. Our own Key Schneller working with the FDA to get all of our handlers registered and China's new food registration system, uh, Decree 2 248, mm -hmm. which is a perfect example of a technical issue that can cause a lot of havoc, uh, a lot of complexity to an already stressed and strained uh, value chain, adding cost, etc. And look at what we're dealing with in Italy right now with containers being sort of rejected at random for very low levels of mold. But you and your team are on it, working with USDA and customers uh, in that market, along with shippers, uh, to get con containers moving again, which is critical to market access so we can get that one ounce in more people's hands. No, exactly. It's a 24-7 job, I think, sometimes, just being really persistent, leveraging our partnerships and alliances, but also understanding what are the things we can and can't control, and how do we look at that in terms of a global landscape. So in that regard, I am very happy to say that Ambassador Doug McCaleb is here with us to help Doug dig into these issues. Now, for those of you who don't know, the U.S. Trade Representative's Office is really the lead in dealing with trade policy and negotiations. But it's Ambassador McCaleb as the chief ag negotiator. It's his role to really focus on what's impacting ag, our challenges, our opportunities, and find the ways to keep American ag exports and California almonds moving into all of these destinations. So with that, Ambassador McCaleb, will you join us? Thanks, Julie. Appreciate that intro. Thank you. Right, please. So, oh, good, I have a cushion now. So it's uh, really great to have you back here in California. Yeah. You were just here a few months ago and spending a lot of time in this great state. And I think it really shows how important the issues are that we're dealing with. And now you can meet a few more of our California friends. But uh, it's been a busy time for you right now. Certainly has, uh, traveling around the globe. Uh, it's really an honor to be in this position and to advocate on behalf of uh, U.S. farmers and to get the best possible trade deals uh, out there for all of you. It's a real honor to work with the uh, Almond Board of California as well. And I'll tell all of you that uh, you have a really hardworking crew from top to bottom at ABC. Um, you know, I was in Brussels a few uh, uh, weeks ago and saw Julie at breakfast uh, out there in engaging um, uh, trading partners on key issues of interest to your, uh, your sector. And, you know, I'm originally from uh, northwestern Pennsylvania, from uh, a dairy part of the country. Worked for USDA for 30 years, and I used to think that uh, uh, dairy farmers were the hardest uh, workers in U.S. agriculture. But I'll tell you, in my years uh, working with uh, tree nut farmers, I've gained an incredible appreciation for the complexity of issues uh, that tree nut farmers uh, have to, to deal with and to face and to overcome in order to have a, a marketable commodity out there, whether it be uh, water restrictions and soil erosion uh, 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 regulations, air quality and emissions uh, regulations, state historic preservation, you name it. Uh, you all have to overcome a lot every year, every growing season to put the uh, commodities that you do on the table. Uh, you are to be commended for that. And it, I feel it incumbent that we uh, in the trade negotiation sector uh, stand up for you uh, to make sure that you get credit for the stewardship and what you put into your commodities and that you get the, the fairest deal possible around the globe in every marketplace that you uh, trade into. That's appreciated. Great. Thank you. So as you're well aware, almond growers are really struggling right now with very low almond prices, very high costs, mm -hmm. uh, and those struggles are exacerbated by the retaliatory tariffs that we're facing specifically in China but also in Turkey. Additionally, we have some of our alternate origin competitors um, who've negotiated some favorable trade relationships with our key markets, the two primary being China and India, uh, creating some pretty favorable economic advantages for them. 
How do you see USTR helping almond growers kind of uh, through, through new trade relationships uh, or better trade relationships claw back some of that economic advantage? Yeah, appreciate that question. Um, you mentioned China and Turkey. I'll, I'll focus on China just for a second. So um, we have bounced back considerably from where we were, say, six years ago, five years ago, on the overall agriculture uh, trade relationship there. Uh, China now represents about $38 billion of U.S. Uh, ag exports. Uh, it's in the number one position, but as you mentioned, there certainly are very uh, concerning irritants there in the trade relationship. Um, we went through a period of time recently where there was a bit of a reconstitution of uh, the Chinese government, including their trade and agriculture uh, teams. And so there wasn't a person named uh, at a ministerial level to work with to address not just the tariff issues, but some of the non-tariff uh, barriers that we've had as well that are, are causing uh, boats not to get into to port and to successfully deliver commodities. So we've resolved that uh, early in uh, uh, January. We will have uh, um, engagements uh, with two countries that you both mentioned there uh, to address some of these concerns. Uh, so that's certainly one part of it is getting back to uh, face-to-face, uh, working through some of these tough uh, agriculture trade uh, issues. A second thing I would mention is just as we certainly want to uh, preserve that market and to do everything we can with it, that it is important to keep a diverse portfolio uh, throughout Asia. And so this administration has placed a, a very high emphasis on, number one, making sure that specialty crops and tree nuts are a key part of the trade uh, agenda and priorities out there. I think you're seeing that reflected, for example, in the India uh, gains that we've made recently. But also uh, placing a great deal of emphasis in making sure that we're hitting every country we can. And there are a lot of uh, uh, smaller geographically countries that have a very fast growing middle class, a very fast growing uh, consumer base who are very interested in tree nut uh, uh, products. So I know you all are uh, very proactive in that. Uh, we are as well. And, and I think the two efforts combined can certainly get us some, uh, some gains there. One last issue I would mention, and while we want to certainly grow our export markets and provide more places for all of you to sell, we also recognize that for the farmer, it's a two-way street. It's also not just how much he's selling, but it's how much uh, uh, the, the out, output costs are for fertilizer, for fuel, uh, for uh, pollinators, for labor, et cetera. So uh, this administration has put a lot of effort into uh, looking at the input costs. Uh, in November, I think it was November 20th or so, uh, we announced a reduction of the duty on uh, phosphorus-based fertilizer uh, from Morocco. That, that uh, duty is going to go from about 19% down to 2%. Um, and in addition, USDA announced a $900 million initiative for uh, domestic uh, fertilizer development uh, as well. So again, it's a complex uh, region, it's a complex uh, subject, but we certainly know at the end of the day, the farmer's got to uh, make a, a positive profit uh, and be able to uh, reinvest and to do everything that they need to do. And uh, USTR is certainly uh, here to make sure that, that that happens. Well, and that's certainly good news to, to hear that and the uh, removal of the retaliatory tariffs in India, of course, was really good news since that's our largest export market. But what can we learn from that approach in, in India? I mean, we're not really negotiating a free trade agreement, but there are opportunities to, to try and address these issues. What are some of the learnings from that that we might be able to, to take to another country? Yeah, certainly getting uh, the retaliatory tariffs uh, off in um, India not just for almonds, but for um, uh, walnuts as well. And then we had a, a, a drop of the 70% retaliatory tariffs on pecans as well. Um, there are a lot of lessons learned from that. I think one macro trade lesson is that using a direct bilateral engagement, we were able to not only get an agreement from the Indian government to change the tariff, but that change went into force uh, already in 2023. So. Uh, just to keep that in perspective, I came on board in January. My first week on board, we had a, a sit-down meeting. Ambassador Tai led that engagement with uh, Minister Goyle from India. And uh, really, in a matter of six months or so, we've, we've seen those actual tariff changes come into force and become official. To contrast that, when we go through maybe an FTA uh, negotiation, uh, you can be looking at anywhere from five to six years of negotiation 
Um, you may have to go through approval in legislatures. And at the end of the day, you can still have the head of state uh, decide to drop out of that agreement. So um, I, I think the success in India was a really uh, excellent example of how you can get directly to making a change that ultimately is going to impact growers and going to impact positively the consumers in those countries as well who want access to almonds and want them at an affordable price. Um, but uh, beyond that, I would say just at a, a granular level, you know, it's all about relationships and spending time. Uh, having uh, uh, not just bilateral meetings together, but having a lunch together. And certainly Ambassador Tai has spent uh, a lot of time uh, prioritizing uh, not just agricultural issues, but prioritizing relationship building. And that goes all the way from the top of USTR down to every staff member on the team. So I know that the Almond Board, uh, same thing. You put a lot of boots on the ground to be in the right places. Uh, USDA does as, as well. So the way I see it, just as we leverage our, uh, our efforts and we're on the same message and we're working together, that's how we can replicate the kind of success that we've had there into some of the other countries that we know we need to make some gains in and, to, and some improvements in. So tariffs are, are one thing, but as we mentioned earlier, not everybody plays by the same rules, or at least sometimes they don't interpret or enforce them in the same way. There's an EU-wide regulation already on pesticide and aflatoxin, but like we mentioned before, all of a sudden, Italy is rejecting containers for very low levels yeah. of mold. We think this is gonna be more complicated as we see more production coming out of Spain and Portugal as well. So how do we work with you and your team to resolve these issues finally? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean. I look at so many parts around the globe and consumers know the quality of U.S. tree nuts. They know the reliability, the consistency of the product, uh, the price point, et cetera. Uh, but in many cases, there is a government standing in between the grower and that consumer that wants the product. And sometimes that government uh, is erecting uh, rationale on what we call SPS or cyto, uh, uh, phytosanitary barriers that really don't align up with the science. So USTR is putting a lot of effort and time not only into holding trading partners accountable for the agreements we already have, and that's, that's really a primary part of it, but in addition, working with trading partners to develop uh, a better transparency, better procedures and, and protocols that ensure that these don't keep popping up in the future as well. Um, because I know our team and FDA was mentioned earlier, USDA, spend a lot of time troubleshooting issues where you've got a boat on the water and that boat may not be accepted into port or we've got a situation where a uh, product is, is rejected. And even more, I think, frustrating for me is not able to be reprocessed for maybe another marketplace, uh, but is being destroyed in port. And that's really criminal at a time when we have uh, food security challenges around the globe. Uh, we've got unsure supply chains. This is really, in my view, an unforced error of, uh, of what our responsibility as public servants is. So USTR takes this very seriously. We are directly engaging with partners. Uh, the trip I mentioned where I saw uh, Julie in, uh, in, in Brussels, uh, again, we were tackling the same issues, maybe not in the same meeting, uh, but hitting the, the key people that need to hear that message and, and pushing for changes in those approaches. Mm -hmm. That's great. So climate and environmental issues are another key focus for, for many of our customers uh, around the world. And we know it's a priority for this administration, but Ammon farmers, uh, in addition to being oftentimes multi-generational stewards of the land, operate in what is probably the strictest regulatory climate here in California relative to almost anywhere. So how do we get credit for the things that we're already doing so that our growing practices are recognized not only as equivalent, but superior in a global context. Yeah, you, you used a key phrase in that question when you said already doing. Um, we certainly encourage and we applaud that nations are um, coming forward with sustainability initiatives, that there's interest in climate. That's, that's a good thing. But what can be a challenge is if those countries say, okay, we're going to shoot off the starting gun, ready, set, let's start counting conservation. When many of the growers in this room, uh, parents and grandparents, have been practicing stewardship since before the Dust Bowl, right? 
So those soil investments, those water quality investments, uh, all of those things need to be built into the policies that are being put in place uh, on sustainability. So USTR is fighting very hard to ensure that countries don't adopt a one-size-fits-all approach, a this is the way you do conservation, these are the practices. When we know from decades of experience that conservation works when it's tailored toward the soil type, toward the rainfall, and that may change from year to year. They, there may be a certain pest pressure that is going to change. And so sound conservation means being flexible enough to really get at the benefit that you're trying to drive at and tailoring it toward the conditions that are gonna get you uh, those changes. So we are heavily involved. European Union's a great example, but that's not the only example. Um, USTR has been building a coalition of countries at the WTO in Geneva to voice this, that we need to have flexibility. And as we have worked on uh, trade um, agreements, and we have a lot in process right now, We're working with Kenya, working with Taiwan, uh, we've had a recent round uh, with Indo-Pacific uh, countries, um, the U.S. government tabled, and when I say tabled, that means bring forward in trade, trade speak. Mm. We brought forward sustainability uh, language for these trade agreements, and that's the first time in U.S. government history that there's been a sustainability uh, text that's been brought into these trade agreements. And it's to do what you're saying. We want to encourage stewardship. That's great. But we also want to make sure that we're not erecting unjustifiable barriers to trade. And that's really uh, what, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Well, I can see we've just about got to the end of our time, so I would just say we appreciate the collaboration. Any parting thoughts as we think about the low-hanging fruit and what we should be able to, to cooperate on together? Any thoughts on what you'd suggest? Yeah, I mentioned a few uh, countries already, those places that we have um, work in place. Uh, Taiwan's a good one. Uh, certainly Kenya is. I think there are a lot of countries throughout Southeast Asia that need to continue to be a big focus for our efforts. Um, I wanted to say um, that in one of my recent trips here to California, I went to the port of Oakland and I watched agricultural products being loaded onto you know, massive vessels. It's something I've seen previously, but the thing that I really uh, took away from this visit is that the longshoremen uh, were part of the tour. We, we visited with laborers who are part of fixing equipment making sure the refrigeration units work, swapping out containers, all those things. And it just reminded me that while all of us in this room, I think, have a deep appreciation for agriculture trade, it has gotten us where we are. Uh, the tree nut industry knows this better than anyone because so much of your product is involved in exports. But we maybe don't do a good enough job within the American public discourse reminding people that it's not just a farm job. That's, those are important, those are right here for me. But all of the mechanics and the machinists and the truck drivers and the longshoremen are all part of the success that you are making happen. So the people in this room, I look out at all of you, I not only see a nutritious product that people want, uh, almonds are fantastic, but I see the families and all of those employees and I see the tax base for the schools and, and everything that all of you are underpinning and making happen. And it's a responsibility for me to do a good job and, and the Biden administration is very much laser focused on making sure we create a trade environment that helps you succeed. But it also means helping all of those employees and all those households succeed. And so. I want to help tell that story, and I really uh, appreciate everything that the Almond Board and the membership can do to help remind people of all the agriculture trade brings. Great. Yeah. Well, Ambassador thank McCaleb, you. thank you so much for your time today. You will find us quite passionate and committed in working with you in, in really seeing California almonds move into more markets. So thank you again for joining us. Good. Thanks, all. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good. Thank you. Okay, for those of you who would like to hear a bit more about trade, uh, tomorrow morning at 10.30, room 10, we'll be talking on a panel with different perspectives on the issues we're dealing with. Jonathan will be back there tomorrow. And we'll also be hearing from Ambassador Eric Garcetti, who is the ambassador to India. He'll be providing some video comments. 
So with that, what I would also like to add is that having a high quality product really starts in the orchard and that's based on research. So I'm happy to turn things over to our ABC Vice President, Chief Scientific Officer, Josette Lewis, and the Chairman of the Strategic Ag Innovation Committee, Ben King, who'll talk to you about leveraging research. Thanks so much. Yeah. Over to you. Thank you, Julie. ABC Research is grounded in science and available to growers, both small and large, with multiple channels including our, our UC Cooperative Research, our PCAs, and our commercial providers, and events like this. For over 50 years, ABC has been flexible in research, and today we need to be more flexible and more adaptable because most growers aren't profitable. We need to face the increasing regulatory scrutiny and market demands. With all this, what are our priorities, Josette? Thanks, Ben. And I do want to emphasize how the role of growers like you, Cooperative Extension, PCAs, and uh, uh, commercial service providers in the industry play a really valuable role in bringing those challenges of the orchard to help shape the priorities that um, ABC funds. Top among them, as no surprise, is probably pest and disease management. Lots of things like to eat almonds in addition to ourselves. Um, and among those, navel orange worm is the most expensive pest that we have to control. We've seen really high damage rates this year, and so it's a reminder that navel orange worm requires vigilance every year and throughout the year. So we do have research to constantly look at new tools to help reduce those costs and to increase the effect effectiveness of control. We add that this year to new research we'll launch on the Carpophilus beetle. You may have heard we have a new uh, invasive pest here in California, came by way of Australia perhaps. Um, <laughs> so uh, another thing that we will be um, figuring out how to control effectively in our orchard. Irrigation is an uh, is expensive input and one that keeps increasing in price. We've been funding research to develop publicly available tools that will allow growers to use actual evapotranspiration, or actual ET, to more precisely dial in tree water demand and get the most crop per drop. So we hope that will become available in the next few years. This time of year, we think about winter sanitation in the orchards, and then we think about pollination as really the start of the next crop year. We're coming up on about 50 years now that the current recommendations for honeybee stocking in the orchard. So we are uh, funding research to see if we can update those recommendations, maybe save a little bit money, a bit of money for the grower, and also really address the self-fertile varieties and see if we can dial that in as well. All of these aim at helping increase efficiency and reduce costs. We know that their costs are a key uh, stress point right now with low prices. As you walked in here, you passed a whole lot of tables out there. Those are organizations that are offering technical assistance and very importantly, some uh, grants and um, incentive programs to help offset some of your costs. There's a great grower breakfast tomorrow morning. I hope you all plan to attend. Um, to help see if we can um, make these government funds more available to you to help reduce your costs and um, reduce some of the pressure on, on your operation. We know growers don't like to fill out paper, so we encourage you to attend and give us feedback on what we, the Owen Board, can do to not just make those opportunities uh, available to you, but to help reduce some of the barriers of participating. Lastly, we've had many years now of investing in ways to create more value from almond co-products, the holes, the shells, and the trees themselves. And I, it's really exciting just in the last year to see a lot of momentum of new companies starting up and coming here to California on the, uh, to create a circular economy to add value to these bio-based industries. We're seeing more public and private investment and we have a great session on Thursday that we'll talk about that, so I hope to see some of you there. Just a few things that we're working on, investments here at the Almond Board. There's a lot of great sessions throughout these three days with additional topics of research and grower practice that hopefully help you make it through another year and get to those good times ahead. So thanks very much.
And I think we're going to hear about global market development next. Thank you, Josette and Ben. As we briefly touched on earlier, part of our efforts this year were focused on the evaluation and improvement of our existing strategies. To help aug to augment that process, we hired Deloitte to assist us in carrying out Project Thea. The goal of Project Thea was to assess the growth potential and demand projections in markets where we are currently invested, as well as evaluate the growth potential in new markets. I'm very glad to hear that we invested in Deloitte and in the Thea study. Um, many organizations around the globe uh, respect Deloitte as a consulting organization and rely on them for their insights. So it's great sort of roadmap and tool for us to follow in the future. Uh, agreed. It was a tremendous effort by staff and a select group of industry members who served on the steering committee for the 11-month duration of the project. I'd like to tape, take this opportunity now to thank everyone for their involvement, uh, their time, and their effort. Here to tell us more about the project and the overall global demand strategy are the chair of the Global Market Development Committee, Brian Izell, and the vice president of Global Market Development, Emily Fleischman. All right, here we are. Well, thanks, Lexi and Clarice. You know, it really uh, was time to take another long-term outlook uh, and inward look at where we were marketing and uh, where we've been and where we want to go. And so part of this Deloitte study was for us to uh, bring them in, get a new set, or I guess an outside set of eyes, uh, looking at all these things, this platform of the world, and saying, you know, are we going the right places? Um, you know, it's been over 10 years since we had done that, and of course the world's changed greatly in 10 years. Uh, our industry has changed greatly, and so has the competitive market uh, of other tree nuts. And, um, you know, the thing that's interesting, if you kind of look at our acreage, you know, just about the last time we did this type of study with Deloitte, uh, we had less than 900,000 acres planted. Now we have over 1.5 million acres planted. And uh, so a lot's changed there. And uh, not just for our industry in almonds, but in California, but the other competing nuts in California as well. We've seen huge growth both in pistachio and walnuts. And, um, and then, of course, um, you know, you look at crops around the world that are grown, um, such as macadamias and all the other ones. Everything's been growing. So our competitive set's really gotten a lot stronger. And then there's that whole other set that Buddy talked about, right? You heard him talk about, you know, these healthy snacking things that aren't nuts and uh, plant-based foods and, and non-dairy type of uh, or, or non-nut <laughs> type dairy products, or non-dairy, no, I was right. Nine, we want the nuts in yeah, there. Yeah, we want the nuts yeah, in there. Not, the yeah, so <laughs> dairy uh, alternatives, like there this. we go. Yes. And a lot of pressure, you know, we kind of own that space for a little bit there uh, with almond milk, but you know, the oat milk and the others really have come on strong. So it's just a very competitive set. So it was time to take a look and say, Okay, we've done well. I think one of the things, I don't know if these guys mentioned it earlier, but we should say that the last time we did this from that point, which was after the 2011 year, yep. up through 2020, we grew by almost a billion pounds. Yep. So that effort really did pay off in helping us go from that, you know, to short of two billion, oh. you know, to almost three billion in 2020. Yeah. Well, and it is always great to get those outside perspectives. I, uh, you know, it's good that Deloitte assessment is just going to continue to give us additional information to push ourselves at the Almond Board. But it was really good to hear a few things from Deloitte. One was that there is future demand to be had in almonds. Um, and it's going to look in a lot of different ways. But they pointed to the positive associations that almonds have that are deeply ingrained in consumers, whether it relates to health or just overall aspirations of having a good life. And it's an enviable place where many products around the globe would love to be. 
And, you know, it was really encouraging because, you know, we've spent a lot of time and focus and effort uh, in 10 main markets uh, over the last 12 years since mm -hmm. that first study and uh, thought maybe there would be, you know, an aha moment that, oh, man, you've been doing that over there? That's crazy, you know. But the reality was, no, we were actually doing the right things and had pick and had chosen the right markets yeah. to attack. And so that was really encouraging from that standpoint. But the good news is they also had some potential new markets that we could look at if we could ever get, you know, the funds to, to spend and the time to spend to develop those markets. And we will figure that out. Yeah, but, we will. Yes. But now beyond the mix of markets that ABC should be in, Dolly also talked about how we position ourselves in the markets. And they, they highlighted a couple areas in there that to think about more globally. And, and one is just this space of innovation. Now, they talked a lot about how snack nuts is going to continue to be an important category for almonds for years to come, but that innovation is such a critical part of the growth for almonds, and it has been over the past many years. These are just some examples of where almonds are showing up today, but that we need to continue to have a focus in that space to help stimulate growth that's going to be critical for the industry. And Deloitte, you know, pointed out not only the importance of innovation, but the continued uh, health message of our product, as well as the environmental stewardship that, you know, is in a sense been a little confusing because, you know, what some people feel is sustainable or okay. stewardship, other people aren't, or it could be crop dependent. But we know it's important, especially in the U.S. and in Europe. Um, and consumers in general are, we're, what we're seeing is more and more they're wanting to know not only how their food is grown, but where it's grown. Mm -hmm. And um, so, <clears throat> you know, part of this Deloitte study, and again, is just kind of reinforcing uh, what we already knew, that it's important that we uh, continue to engage in telling our stories of how we grow almonds um, and how they are beneficial to consumers because if we don't tell that story, both consumers, food companies, and policy makers at this time are making a lot of buying decisions based on that information. Uh, and so we need to tell our story and we have a great story to tell. We do, we do. Yeah. So I, uh, we talked a lot about Deloitte and how they looked out at the future, but I'd love for us to take a minute to kind of talk about some of the things we're doing now in the programs we have across the globe. Yeah, and you know, because we're in, challenging times and we're competing, you know, at a higher level with more competitors than we've ever had. You know, we've got to double down on what we've been doing. We're doubling down on marketing as much as possible and especially our nutrition research as you kind of heard a little bit earlier. It is impressive that the Almond Board is currently doing to build global demand and uh, we've done a lot in 2023 and before we jump into a few key things that we're going to highlight right here at the end. Uh, we'd like to show you some samples of what we've been doing this past year. secret is staying in your pride. You just gotta want it, baby. Eating almonds can help you recover from exercise. So eat your almonds. Oh, you're proud.
ideas from each of us, put them together, and grow some great almonds. I'm out here in the Central Valley of California for the Almond Bloom. 80% of the world's almonds come from California. All right, so you can see that the ABC certainly is doing a lot to help build demand. And um, this year we launched several big consumer initiatives in hopes to supercharge demand for almonds. So, yes. Emily? Yeah, so in fact, you all probably know we partnered with Dion Sanders this year, the biggest spokesperson that the Almond Board has ever engaged with. He's also known as Coach Prime, for those of you who don't know. Um, and you know, going into this partnership, we knew Dion was gonna have a big year, right? He had moved up to the Pac-10, he was making a ton of changes to the CU program and, and really disrupting football and getting a lot of attention along the way. So he, he seemed like the perfect partner to marry up to tell the story of our exercise recovery research that came out last January. Uh, and, uh, you know, we honestly never could have guessed how good of a partnership with this would be. Amen. I mean, Dion yeah, has, crazy. you know, 10 times the number of amount of exposure we've received from any other spokesperson we've ever had before. Um, and, you know, you may have heard of the prime effect. So things like the Colorado football tickets actually costed more than the opening games for the NFL tickets this year. So pretty big. All the prime gear was sold out of stores. They can't keep it on shelf. And all of the energy ended up resulting in Fox and sport, uh, ESPN putting their big game day shows in Boulder, Colorado, despite the fact that last year, Boulder or Colorado had a one and 11 record. It was all because of the energy that Dion brings with him. Uh, and it resulted in a ton of media coverage for Dion, which works well for us. Here's a couple cover, uh, covers that he got this year. And, you know, in general, things have just been electric for Dion. And it's been great for California almonds because it's been able to send that message about how almonds are fueling recovery across the U.S. So we are so excited about what we've seen so far from Dion, and there is more to come. But now I want to switch us over to another campaign that launched this All right, year. Let's hear it. Yes. Yeah, so we launched a new campaign in Germany this fall, and, and you know I think the story behind Germany is really interesting. So this is a market where they you know, traditionally have used almonds, but it's mostly been in the sweet form. So think marzipan and baking. Uh, but about 10 years ago, so prior to my time, right, right. more in your space, the GMDC yeah. decided it was time to start encouraging snacking in Germany. Snacking was growing across the globe, but it was just a really wonderful opportunity for almonds. And it has worked out really well. Volume has increased in that market about 40% yeah. over those 10 years, uh, but it was time for a new campaign. And so we, uh, so we <laughs> wanted to bring to life the naturalness of almonds because we know that naturalness really resonates with the German consumer. So while the US had Dion as their spokesperson, Germany brought to life Mother Nature as our spokesperson to be the mother of all snacks. There we go. Um, and this campaign has surrounded consumers on TV, online, influencers, and we want to share with you one of the ads. <laughs> nicht läuft wie geplant, es ist Zeit für ein paar Mandeln. Mit der Kraft von natürlichem Protein. Mandeln, die Mutter aller Snacks. All right, so now I'm going to take us across the globe again, Brian. All right. All right, so we're going to go to India. So I'd say it's probably an understatement to say we're all pretty bullish on India. I think yeah, so. I think just a little. Just a little bit. Yeah. And Deloitte definitely reinforced that. Um, and part of it is the cultural connection that yeah. Indians have with almonds. And it comes to life in the form of some, the morning occasion where they feed their children, mothers send their kids up to school with a few almonds in the morning to kind of uh, ensure that they perform well in school. And the second is gifting. Almonds are a very auspicious gift. And and this came to life last, year, last week in a very special way. Um, so I don't know if you heard about this, but 41 workers were trapped in a tunnel in India for 17 days. And uh, luckily, all of them yes, got out safely. Um, but it was really interesting because the, those that were rescued gave almonds as their, a gift of thank you to those who rescued them. Just happened all on its own. Um, so pretty, I think a pretty good testament yeah. to where yeah. almonds sit. Yeah. 
Exactly. Now we did, of course, try to make sure that the world knew about that, so there was some activity we did to like yeah. spread the news about how almonds were used and remind people of the different health benefits that almond had. Um, but, now, that's just a really recent example um, of some of the things we did, but you know, the market in general is just heating up. The competition is getting fiercer. Um, everybody sees the 1.4 billion people in India as a great opportunity. And the growing, you know, um, middle class and, yes. you know, everything. It just has a lot of big potential. It does. I'm super excited. And so we had a great opportunity this year when the, the Cricket World Cup returned to India for the first time in 12 years. So the Almond Board uh, partner, or didn't partner, we created a whole ad and you saw it in the sizzle video highlighting cricket and almonds and that ran on TV and digital and then we also put 36 billboards around Delhi and Mumbai. Okay, So we knew our time was short today and but we did want to give you in the broader audience that comes to this uh, a little taste of what we've been doing. Um, I want to assure you um, that when I have been involved at the uh, GMDC for a long time uh, and in this industry and also working for a large company that does everything this staff does except for another competing nut, but I can tell you that um, you should feel uh, really secure and really comfortable and really encouraged that we have the staff that we have. I mean, you've seen all the people that have come up on stage already. This, uh, our marketing staff that's here, uh, or I guess in Modesto, but you know, we have people all over the world and partnerships all over the world are just outstanding, hard driving, imaginative, creative, innovative people that execute. And uh, I can't imagine a better team uh, to have in times like this because I'm very encouraged. You know, Richard talked about him being encouraged. Uh, that things will eventually get better, and, and they always do, right? Every, every cycle, uh, especially in the agricultural crops, go through cycles where people uh, get excited and maybe over a little bit, and there has to be a little correction. And, uh, but I think we have the right team, and I think we have the right programs, and with Deloitte's study, I think we have, again, a right direction of where we need to go in the future. Yeah, I'm excited about the future too, Brian. And, and, you know, we and my team really focused on, you know, what can we do to make sure that almond growing is here and thriving for the long term? And that's not, not 10 years down the road, it's 100 years down the road. And, um, you know, Brian mentioned the team that we have, and, you know, they are some of the most uh, talented and passionate and relentless people that I've ever worked with. So I want you to know that we're working for you and we're not stopping. Okay, so quick reminder, there is a session on Thursday morning. Uh, I'll just hope that you guys come, but I want to let you know there will be a signed football being given away uh, by Dion. Her, he won't be the one giving it away. Did he it's actually like signature. throw it in a game or make a touchdown with it or anything? I, I'm sure. Totally. Okay, yeah. yeah I'm going to, yeah, yeah. you know, in marketing, we got to <laughs> embellish all that stuff. So all those things have happened to you that ball. You obviously right. learned very well. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. And then lastly, I just wanted to let you know something. Uh, if you didn't catch this already, Dion was named Sports Person of the Year by Sports Illustrated last week. So a huge honor for him. And we want to make sure he knows that we're really excited for him as well. So there'll be a crew down in the reception to getting video footage of growers and industry members congratulating Dion, and we'll be compiling it into a social media message to congratulate Dion. So thank you guys very much for your time. Yes, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Brian. Oh, oh you're welcome. And thank you, Emily. Yes. I hope you enjoyed watching uh, all the activity that the marketing team is involved in generating. Very exciting and very interesting content around the world. So um, as I uh, start in the industry and come before you all today, um, certainly there's been some very powerful insights shared here today. And as I mentioned during our listening sessions, if I came into contact with you in the four, or let's see, eight cities and um, I think 700 miles from one end of the valley to the other, we had the great pleasure of being with the industry and hearing what you had to say. Um, my passion for agriculture in California stems from, four gen from generations of my family that's, that go back to 1773. Uh, they farmed lots of different crops over those years, and they had good times and bad. And they had to adapt as situations changed. 
And as we heard today, we've got a lot of moving parts, as you all know. So, as I study the history of the almond industry, it's clear that adapting has been essential. Grit and innovation have been a hallmark of this industry since the first commercial crops in the 1950s, when almonds were 18 cents a pound. It's hard to believe. Um, since then, um, in, 1950, in 1910, actually, a huge oversupply was the situation, um, and they had pricing going all over the place. World War I, Depression, World War II, um, they struggled as an industry to emerge. In 1933, prices hit an all-time low of eight cents a pound. It's hard to imagine <laughs> what that was like. But in 1934, they started to bounce back. Why did they bounce back? This is what I was curious about in these cycles. What is it that can accelerate our rebound from these cycles? In most cases, it was innovation. In farming, in packaging, in that case, and of course, a better macro environment, and as Mother Nature smiles on us, a decent crop. And then, by the 40s and 50s, almonds were the fastest growing deciduous nut tree crop in the world. And their motto at the time was, keep our present customers and work hard to find new ones. Almond growers petitioned the US government and voted to establish the federal marketing order. That was a significant step in the industry and it caused a lot of growth. Research, innovation, quality and profitability and knowledge followed. Then in, 18, in 1949, President Truman signed the bill for almonds to be eligible for federal marketing programs. This was a step change. Not to say they didn't have their ups and downs, but the industry grew and generations prospered. Many of you are part of those generations that prospered in those days. Unfortunately, in the 1970s, when the energy crisis hit, inflation, interest rates, fuel, inputs, transportation costs all soared while, double, while, beating, or, sorry, while bearing acres doubled. Can you imagine? All of those things going the wrong way and you have twice as many acreage in the ground. At the same time, buyers drove demand for higher almond quality and QA standards. So more costs injected into the industry. That sent shockwaves around the world and it disrupted what had been orderly growth for quite some time. The growers hit a really difficult time required different marketing and innovation, focused strategies to step change the industry and deal with these new conditions. Does that sound familiar? Yes, we've been hearing about that all afternoon. To operate in a rapidly changing environment and changing world and marketplace, we have to continue to evolve our future success. The federal marketing order did evolve, and obviously the focus on marketing, advertising, innovation, global markets, and relationships worked as the industry grew exponentially as the energy crisis waned. So what can we learn from the past? And how can we unlock a prosperous future? Well, what got us here won't get us there. Similar challenges, but very different tactics to get us to this next chapter. We must fight hard together to get to this next chapter. I'm fortunate to have the insights that we've got from, Delo from Deloitte and the Thea project. Those will serve as a tool to help guide us and to go deeper in the existing markets and to start to discover new markets and new ways of getting into those markets. As we look to the future, we must accelerate aggressive marketing and advertising. We have to be bold and scrappy and concise and targeted and memorable. We have to advance our omni-channel public relations efforts, protecting and enhancing the brand of almonds and the category of almonds. We have to own our markets and our narrative that almonds have a positive effect on the environment without doing one thing differently today. We have to win over the trade to prefer almonds as the best choice as an ingredient and a snack. Almonds are the most 
nutritionally dense, shelf-stable protein on the planet. Everybody has to know that. We must own this narrative and we must tell our story to key audiences and to influencers and to continue to develop and leverage our relationships to educate, provide accurate information, and trust in our expertise to create a better trade environment over time. We must innovate and develop new ideas for almond products and byproducts. Who would have thought of, that almonds could be made into milk? There are more things to create. We have to influence and inspire companies, consumer products and food service as they endeavor to make the foods that they sell more healthy. We're their solution globally. We need to educate chefs in training. There are thousands of chefs that are graduating from culinary schools all over the world every six months. They need to know how to cook and formulate with almonds and prefer them. And we need to deepen our research on health and nutrition and elevate our ability to make claims or work with others who can make claims on our behalf to tell the story of the health and nutritional density of almonds. 24 almonds a day keeps the doctor away, is what I say to my friends. I can't publicize that, <laughs> but I think you remember when Apple said an apple a day keeps the doctor away. There are slogans like that that we need to go after, and it is 24 almonds according to Dr. Josette in terms of what's the ultimate, that you, the minimum you must eat for ultimate health benefit. Huge opportunities ahead. I've just scratched the surface. I'm so energized that we're working with such an amazing product. But today, as the industry struggles to deal with the challenges, many of which we don't control, it's critical to pull together and focus on what we can control and what we can influence to find our way forward. I'm so grateful for the openness and the welcome that I've had from so many people up and down the state. We're fortunate to have a committed and knowledgeable board who gives their time and expertise to help create our future. And we're also very fortunate to have an incredibly talented team at the Almond Board who are very well networked and work hard every single day to drive this industry forward. I've been very impressed. So impressed with how all of you work together help each other and you care so deeply. I encourage you that if you're interested in getting involved more deeply, please seek out a board member or a committee member. Um, we would love to have your input and your partnership because we're always looking for solutions-oriented people. I believe it's the key to what got this great industry to where it is today. And I believe it's also the key to what will take us forward. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be part of this great industry and collaborate with you all to bring our next chapter to life. As we begin our 174th year as a commercial crop in the state of California, I thank you for your commitment, for your input, and for your partnership. We have some difficult times to endure, but I'm certain that strong leadership, focus, and the industry DNA of grit and innovation will get us to a better place in the near future. I'm very excited for what's ahead. Thank you very much. Well, Richard, in light of this being your last conference, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge you for all of your hard work and effort over the years. Um, it's been a pleasure working with you, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and myself, I just wanted to thank you for all that you've done for the organization and the industry, and that includes your support of Clarice throughout the transition process. Absolutely, thank you. Richard? <laughs> I too am extremely appreciative of, of the time that I've had to spend with you. It's really been a luxury to have a few months um, I've done my best to extract everything from this man's brain that I can, <laughs> questions I can think to ask. And he's been very gracious with his time and insights. So 
I can't imagine a more illustrious career of 21 years and, and being part of the variety of what this industry has been through. So congratulations to you. I wish you all the best in your retirement and stay in touch. <laughs> I'm going to be calling you. Not going too far. So thank you both for those comments. And thank you all for your attention uh, today and throughout the history of, of this conference, uh, which goes back 51 years. So it's been, been wow. a long time. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of things. One is I really do believe we're embarking sort of on the next phase of the industry, certainly different than what I experienced over the last 20 years in several significant ways. And uh, I have had the opportunity to have uh, about three months of overlap with Clarice uh, and going through the onboarding experience and, on, and offboarding, I guess. I don't know <laughs> if we use that term. But uh, it's gone really well, and uh, I'm just really pleased and confident that handing over the leadership to ABC to Clarice is a really smart move, and uh, very confident she'll do a great job for you, uh, as, uh, as I am confident in the future of, of the organization as well as uh, this industry. So um, again, thank you for all your support over the years, and I look forward over the next couple of days to visiting with you uh, throughout the conference. So. Thank you very much. Sure.